Well, for tonight, we're going to do something just a little bit different. Go ahead and take your Bibles out, of course, and prepare for the message. But tonight, we are going to push the pause button on our reboot series. I know some of you are looking at me like, are you serious? We are. I've got something pretty good for you tonight, though, and I think you're going to enjoy it. This past week, we've had the privilege of spending some time with Pastor Seth and Miss Stacia, and we've really always enjoyed being with them, but it was cool this week because I was, my wife and I were able to be a part in a big surprise for Stacia. Her mom and dad contacted us months ago and said, if we fly in and surprise her, can you pick us up at the airport and just drop us off at their house? So this past Tuesday night, we picked up Stacia's parents from the airport and dropped them off at Stacia's house where they knocked on the door to their complete surprise. We've been able to spend some time with them this week, and I'm so thankful. The interesting thing is, when we were first, about a year ago, talking to Pastor Seth and Stacia about becoming our youth pastor, we learned that Stacia was from the area of Indianapolis, Indiana, which is where we'd been for so many years. We learned that she was the daughter of a man who was a youth pastor for a lot of years who had been very kind to my wife and I in helping us become acclimated to certain aspects of youth ministry. And I thought, wow, so that's your dad. And it immediately gave me a positive impression of Seth and Stacia because of their parents. It's funny, isn't it? How you, the father, were so kind and friendly to this young 21-year-old couple, not realizing how valuable that would end up being to your daughter and her future husband. But it was. So when he was coming into town, I said, I would love it. So he's now the senior pastor, Cornerstone Baptist Church on the east side of Indianapolis, Indiana. And I said, I would love it because of your kindness and generosity and friendliness towards us, if you would speak to the people of Maranatha and allow them to see someone who was so kind and friendly to us and also to see the father and mother of uh, Stacia and Pastor Seth's in-laws. So Pastor Rick Salazar is invited to come up and to speak for us and just thank you so much for using your vacation to present the scripture to us. <laughs> Not a problem. Appreciate All right. It. If you would, please go ahead and turn to Judges chapter number seven. I love the book of Judges. You can learn a lot of practical things that the Lord tries to teach us. I uh, do want to thank you on behalf of my wife and I and uh, Seth's favorite mother-in-law and uh, in that uh, for being so kind to our children. I'm supposed to grab something under here. This? Okay. All right. All right. And, uh, but they, you guys have been so kind. They absolutely love and adore this church, and I'm glad that you've taken them in. And, uh, and so we're thankful uh, for that. Thank you for your hospitality. We've uh, followed them around uh, since we got here on Tuesday night. I'm ready to go home and rest. And uh, uh, in that, we've had a lot of stuff uh, to do and uh, got to go to the Grand Canyon. Boy, I tell you, wow, was God showing off, huh? And uh, I mean, I, I couldn't wait to get there. I, I wanted to hurry and get to just look over at it. And when you, when you first see it, my first thought was, how can people say this just happened? The heavens declare the glory of God, and so does a lot of good places on the earth. A place for me and my dad. My, my dad is still alive. Both my, my wife and I have lost our mothers. They are both in heaven today. But we have our dads, and my dad likes to go fishing. He lives in Pueblo, Colorado. He likes to go fishing up in Lake San Isabel. Well, you go there first thing in the morning. You're sitting there looking at just, it looks like glass, the lake. And you have the stillness of the morning, and you're the first couple of people down there. And a lot of times, my dad and I will just sit and just go, wow. Just wow. To have the privilege of being in the United States military and gone all over all, all kinds of places in this world, seeing a lot of beauty and just said, wow. Just wow. We serve an awesome God. I'm going to talk about that awesome God that Gideon <clears throat> was serving, if you would, out of respect for God's word. If you'd stand with me, let me read down through the first seven verses of uh, Judges chapter number seven. Then Jeroboam, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early 
and pitched, and pitched beside the well of Herod. And the hosts of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill Morak in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to and proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early to Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will try them for thee. And it shall be of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall uh, not go with thee, the same shall not go. And he brought them down, <clears throat> and he brought down the people unto the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth water with his tongue as a dog lappeth him, shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon the knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped and put their hand to their mouth were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By 300 men that lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. Let the other people go, every man to his place. Father, we just ask that you'd bless the reading of your word. Just bless us tonight as we study your word. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Now, if you've never read the book of Gideon, if you don't know what's going on, in chapter number six, the Midianites have come with a couple of other people, and they have been just raping the land of Israel of all of its crops, of all of its uh, livestock, and just causing the people to go and to hide in caves and dens. Every time that a new crop and stuff comes in, these people just keep coming. Why is that? Well, the Bible tells us in chapter 6 that the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So he used the Midianites to get their attention. The funny thing is, is they waited for seven years, the Bible says, before they cried out and said, hey, God, we need some help. But in that meantime, God was preparing a man. And the angel of the Lord, which was a pre-incarnate vision of Christ, had come down, and there was this guy that was hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat, because he didn't want to have his crops stolen. And the Lord comes down to this man and says this to him. The angel of the Lord appeared and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now, this man that he was talking about was somebody by the name of Gideon. Gideon is like, who? Me? Obviously, you've got me confused with someone else. He said, no. I want you to notice something about Gideon that Gideon didn't see in himself. When, when God saw Gideon, he saw a mighty man of valor. Notice that he didn't say that he was going to be a mighty man of valor, but he said, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon was already what God wanted him to be, but Gideon was fearful. This morning when I had the, uh, the, the blessing to be able to uh, talk to the teenagers, we talked about fearful obedience. You study chapter 12, you'll see that God called a fearful man. He just didn't call a fearful man, but he commissioned that fearful man. He said, hey, I want you to go. I want you to deliver Israel for me. He says, I'm going to be with you. So as a matter of fact, the next thing that he did is he put him to the test. He said, I want you to go to your father's house, and in your father's house, there is an altar to Baal. And there is also a statue that is there. I want you to cut the statue down, take that wood, lay it out, tear down the altar, take your father's prize bull, bring it, and sacrifice it to me. He was afraid. He had been called. He'd been commissioned. Now he's put to the test. 
and he passed the test. He went at night, and he did what he was supposed to do. In doing so, he made the people wake up to the fact that they were idol worshipers. And so, when he was looking for some encouragement, God sent him some encouragement because we read about the two fleeces. When we think about Gideon, we think about the two fleeces. He said, God, make the fleece wet, the ground dry, and then I'll know that you really want to use me. God did it. Rang out that fleece, got a bowl full of water. He said, God, please be patient with me. This time, do the opposite. And God did. You read in chapter 6, God never rebukes Gideon. So here you pick up, and God is talking to this fearful man. He's still afraid. But God's going to use him. And he tells him, he says, hey, he says, call the people. Well, in chapter 6, the first time he blew his trumpet, just his family showed up. You ever needed help? And only your family showed up? And you thought, hmm, this is good, but I need more. He sent messengers out. And in, in sending that messengers out, in verse number 1, we see Gideon, who has a nickname, Jerubel, which means the enemy of Bel, because he tore down the altar. He has a little rep now. Steer fearful. God says, I want to use you. And Gideon's thinking, all right, down in the valley are 135,000 Midianites and some other folks. And I have 32,000 people. What in the world am I going to do? God says, you're going to listen to me. Now, those of you who have been in the military, and I've seen a lot of different military men uh, since I have been here. I'm glad that you're very proud of, of your military service. You should be, and I thank you for it. But if we're sizing up things, 32,000 versus 135,000, the odds are stacked against you. And that's exactly what Gideon was facing. So then God comes to him and says, Gideon, he says, the men that you have with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Why is that? Because of pride. He says, they'll be too prideful. The Bible tells us that pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. The Bible tells us that a man's pride will bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. God was looking at the men that were there, and he said, you know what? This is what I want you to do. Tell the ones that are afraid to go home. This is a fearful man, Gideon. Send them home? All right, Lord. Maybe just a few will go. 22,000 just like that. He has lost one-third of his army. Just be honest with me. Put yourself in Gideon's shoes. How many of you would be saying, you know what? We're going to whip those guys. They have no idea what's coming. <laughs> or would you be a little bit worried going, hmm, I sure wish I was back in that wine press. I sure wish I was still threshing wheat. Okay, Lord. I remember. See, what was his name again? Jonathan. <sighs> Saved by many or not by few. Yeah, I remember that story. Okay. All right, I've got this 10,000. What do you want me to do now? He said, yet they are still too many. Are you kidding me? I mean... You know, we, we think of these people and we think that they were just, you know, mind-numb robots. This was a man of flesh and blood, just like you and just like me. You ever been put in an impossible situation? You ever gotten a call that you thought, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this situation? This was Gideon. God said, I can't use that many. So then God tells him, let me, let me handpick these guys for you. Look, look at the verse. That's what it says down there in verse number four. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will try them for thee. Isn't that what it says? God said, I'll pick them for you. And that shall be of whom I say unto thee, thou shalt go with thee. 
uh, the same shall go with thee. And whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So God uses a very unusual test. He brings them down to get a drink of water. He says, I want you to watch how they drink. So they come down, and there are some guys that just get down on the ground, and they are just like, oh, mm, that's some good stuff. That's some good water. But then there's some other guys. They're watching. They're afraid. See, a lot of times we think, well, Gideon's 300. They must have been some mighty men. Uh -uh. You read some background history in that? Many people believe, and just hear my thought out, that these 300 were the 300 most fearful men. They were too afraid to leave with the 22,000. And now, with the enemy being down in the valley... A few miles away, they're still watching to see if they're on their way. Now, all of us that have ever stood watch before knows that you're supposed to, to, to keep watch. But God wanted to prove to Gideon that he was going to deliver Israel. Think about it. Think of the different situations God has allowed you to be in. As I look across this crowd, there are some very mature people in this audience. There are some people that have some miles on them. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. You have lived life. I look at myself now. I have been at my church for 25 years. I was a youth pastor for the first 15, the associate pastor for eight, and now the pastor for a year and a half. I want to go back to being the youth pastor, to be honest with you. It is a whole lot easier. But that's not where God has me. And I've got some miles on me. I, me, me and my wife went to a retirement party for, for one of our favorite pastors, Brother Woods. Our pastor retired at 38 years. Brother Woods retired at 40 years in the ministry there at Whittier Lane Baptist Church. And as we're traveling back to church, I told my wife, I said, do you realize that we're the old people now? She said, I'm the old person now. Okay, just me. A lot of the guys that are pastoring the churches, as a matter of fact, the, the one that took the pastor of that church where Brother Woods retired, I watched grow up through high school as a youth pastor. The young man that serves as our youth pastor, I watched grow up. People like young Peter over there. Pastor, pastor, excuse me. Peter over there. I'm 57 years old. And only a year and a half of pastoring. There are a lot of people that call and want wisdom. I'm like going, what, what do you mean wisdom? <laughs> but if I'm not careful, I become just like Gideon. And I look at the odds that are stacked against me. And I say, I, I, I can't do it. Lord, I can't do it. But you know what? God always has a purpose when we will follow him. Now, here Gideon was with 300 scared men. And you think, well, it's only going to get better, right? Mm-mm. Look at God's unusual battle plan for him. Look down at verse number 9. It says, And it came to pass that same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise and get thee down uh, unto the host, and I will, deliver it, I will deliver it into thine hands. But if thou fear to go down, <clears throat> go with uh, uh, Pruna, thy servant, down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterwards thou, uh, thy hands... Uh, Shall thy hand be strengthened to go down unto the host? God says, listen. This is the night before the battle. He says, I want you to sneak down to the enemy camp. You've got to go down in the valley. He says, I'm going to give you some encouragement there. He says, but you're, if you're too afraid to go by yourself, 
take your servant. So they go down. Now, I don't know about you. I never liked being close to the enemy line with just two people. And there's 135,000 people there that are ready to wipe you off the face of the earth. But God is such an awesome God. He wanted to give him encouragement in an unusual way. Look with me, please. And the Bible tells us, verse number 11, uh, 11, and he went down with uh, uh, Funa, his servant, unto the outside uh, of the armed men uh, that were in the host. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number, as of the sand of the seaside for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley uh, bread tumbled uh, into the host of Midian and came unto the tent and smote it, and it fell, and overturned it, and the tent lay long. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. For into, uh, for into his hands hath God delivered Midian and all the host. Now, could you imagine hearing that? You're, you're afraid of the enemy, when in reality, the enemy is afraid of you. What did, what did Gideon do when he heard that? Look at verse number 15. And it was so that when Gideon heard the telling of his dream and the interpretation thereof, that he what? He worshiped. Well, I loved Pastor, Pastor Peter's illustration this morning. And that was awesome. Did you imagine what Gideon did? He heard that. He probably looked at Funa and went, <laughs> Ever done that? <laughs> Ever done that? No? Oh, yeah. Husbands, you ever been right about something? <laughs> you don't go, see, I told you so, woman. No, nah. you just secretly go. <laughs> just no. Sorry. Am I the only husband that does that? <laughs> don't tell my wife. All right. But you know what? He received encouragement, encouragement that he was going to need. Because the next thing that he was going to have to do was pass out the instruments of war. Look at verse 15. It says, When Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped, and he returned to the host and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered uh, into your hands the host of the Midians. And the other 300 are going, "Uh uh-huh. All right. He says, no, really. Probably told them. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. And put a trumpet in every man's hand and an empty pitcher and lamps within the pitcher. And he said unto them, look upon me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow the trumpet and I and that that are with, excuse me, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now, I don't know about you. This is the strangest battle plan I'd ever heard. (laughs) Think about it. 300, 300, 300. Where's the swords? You don't get a sword. You get a ram's horn. You get a pitcher. And you get a lamp. It's say, what in the world can those do? Those instruments in the hand of God can defeat a foe of 135,000 men. What was God's promise to Gideon? You shall smite them as one hand. See, pitchers were vessels. The Bible tells us that we need to be fit vessels for Jesus Christ in order to be used. How are you as a vessel? Because inside that vessel was to be a light. Does not the Bible tells us, tell us that we are the light of the world? A city on a hill cannot be hid. 
We're supposed to shine the light of Jesus Christ into this world. What in the world can a hundred trumpets do? They can declare the glory of God. See, the battle tactics of that day were this. Wars didn't take place at night. And if they did, only a few soldiers would carry lamps so that it would light up the battlefield. And fewer would carry trumpets to sound for the battle. Imagine if you would. Gideon was told to go at night. So he surrounds this valley with his 300. And during the changing of the midnight watch, when all the host of Midian was asleep except for a few guards, God told Gideon, it's time to attack. You know how they attacked? They took the lamps, or they took the pitchers, they broke them all at one time. I still remember working at a place called Furs, right? No. What was the stinking furs? My grandma hated it. Or liked it, but I don't know. Anyway, I remember one time walking to the back with a bunch of glasses and stepping on a wet floor and and hearing the sound of 36 glasses all breaking at one time all around me. Anybody ever been there? Okay. Could you imagine 300 pitchers breaking at one time? All of a sudden, the hillside is lit up. And 300 trumpets all blow at one time. The Bible tells us, and I'm almost out of time, so I'm just going to tell you the story. That the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east took their swords and turned one upon another. And wiped themselves out. What did God promise Gideon? He said, I'm going to take you as a fearful man. I'm going to take these other 300 fearful men, and I'm going to take you into battle, and you're going to win. So many times, the odds are so against us. We think, we'll never overcome this world. I'll never be able to. And you can fill in the blank. All of us are there. There are a lot of times pastors sit in their offices thinking, How am I going to handle this? How can I get through this situation? How can I help this family here? And that's when God sometimes has to gently remind us, excuse me, I'm here. If I can take a fearful man and turn him into a champion and give the land rest for 40 years... He can handle any of our problems at any time. Gideon, you know what happened? When all that stuff took place, Gideon blew his trumpet again. And those fearful 22,000 that were just kind of hanging in the wings, guess what they did? They got in the fight. You know what God needs? He needs warriors that, are, that were willing to be in the fight. Remember David looking at the giant, saying, hey, buddy, this is what's going to happen. After the giant talked trash to him, he said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut off your head. And when I'm done, I'm going after all the rest of you. He was the first sniper recorded in history. One shot, one kill. <laughs> it's in the book. Headshot at that. What did he do? He ran up upon Goliath, pulled out his own sword. Got it. What did the Philistine army do? They were gone. Guess what his brothers and the rest of the Israelite army did? Wow. He beat Goliath. Maybe God could use us right into the battle. It's a whole lot easier for people to get involved when they see people serving the Lord together. 
The music tonight was beautiful. You know why? Because we all got involved in the service. There's a piano player. There was a song leader. And they could have probably done a fine job, and we could have all sat there and just been entertained. But we got involved. We sang. I'll be honest with you. I sang, but I listened to these guys up here, the trumpet player. Kid's good. <laughs> but we need to get involved. There are things that I know that scare you about serving God. There are doubts, I'm sure, that many of us have in our life. I have them. I have them. But then God has to gently remind me that if he can take a fearful man with 300 fearful soldiers and defeat a well-trained, well-armed army, that God can do anything in my life. And he can do anything in your life as well. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please.